Right, that's us live now. Fantastic. We as well just kind of hang around and, and wait for people to show up for a few minutes. Yeah. So, can you see the little eye in the corner? Um, when I click on this up the top, I don't know if you've got it, but it says live. No. Oh, I've got, I've got a, a live and the and the timing. Yes. Yeah. So um, I can see the stats now, so we can know when there's people here. Okay. So we've got, um, six people watching already, which is good. Four on our, four on fish signs and two oh. in the Wildlife Press Keeper page. That's good. Oh, good. Yeah. Just see here, <laughs> talk <Hello>. people. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, we have a bit more success than we did last week. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, anyone that's watching, this is obviously Dave Poole from Fish Science. Uh, Dave's been working with Lothian Fish Keepers, uh, supporting us anyway, um, for about two years now, maybe even more. Probably a little bit more, yes, yeah. Yeah, so um, he's, he's been a good friend to us. Um letting us know all about his foods um, and we've been getting the chance to try out some foods as well um, and with the recent changes um, Dave's not been able to reach out to the fish community as well as he would normally do. Um, normally we'd be up and down the country visiting um, fish societies and doing really you know, really good talks and he'd been on stop but um, we've been doing some live streams uh, with various different peoples peoples <laughs> Uh, various different um, fish keepers um, on all, all different platforms as well. And we're uh, going to be working on a weekly one with Lothian Fish Keepers. Um, and this week, our topic is going to be about fish science. So what we want to find out is, you know, what what is fish science? Why did you set it up? You know, what's your plans for it? You know, what, what drove you to this? And all that kind of thing. So um, just to let our followers um, and find out more about fish science and, and why, you know, last year they won best fish food in the UK from the Practical Fish Keepers magazine readers. So, um, Dave, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, say hi. Yeah, well, I, I think a number of people probably probably know me. My name's Dave Poole. I'm uh, the person that started fish science a little over eight years ago. Um Started it with the aim of, of you know, producing and, and developing a, a new brand of fish food. Um, and background before that was fish health and fish nutrition. Uh, I did a, a PhD in, in koi carp diseases at Liverpool University, which was sort of the, the start of, of me, sort of, I suppose, turning a hobby into a, a profession. And mm -hmm. I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to be able to keep that going for the last... 30 odd years so uh, it's flown past really enjoyable but uh, allowed me to sort of meet a lot of fantastic people and a lot of those people have helped me with fish science to develop it to where it is now yeah i think developing food for the aquatic hobby along with alongside people that keep fish you know that's a, a definite way of creating something that's going to work um when you're listening to the fish keepers um, and hearing what they've got to say, what they like and don't like, what works, doesn't work. You know, if, you've, if you're if you in tune with that, then, you know, you're halfway there to success. For sure. I think it's, yeah, and, and it is important. Uh, you know, there's, I, I don't think the shops and, and the trade would were sort of sat there hoping that there was going to be another fish food. Um, you know, there's plenty of fish foods out there, some really good fish foods. So what we had to do with, fish science was just to try and be a little bit different yeah and we did that with some of the ingredients but also the approach we took where we've worked very closely with with shops and and also worked very closely with fish keepers and people that know you know what they're doing know about fish mm -hmm. uh, they've helped massively you know it, it can't sort of under understate how much comments that people have made have, have really impacted the the way that the um that the foods have developed and the ingredients and the formats and and we we use that feedback all the time you know the foods are improving all the time mm -hmm. yeah and everyone that comes out just gets better and better Absolutely. Well, <laughs> good of you to say yeah <laughs> i might be biased but you know i've never come across a bad fish science food yet and i don't think i will to be honest 
What would you say? I mean, I, and and I, I was going to say probably, you know, the process that we go through helps to avoid that because we have had some bad ones. Um, fortunately, they've not been launched. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always a when you're developing a fish food, you come up with an idea and sometimes that idea doesn't work. Uh, you know, sometimes you, you you find that the ingredients don't work or you need to tweak something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can give a, a great example of that. We we had a or we have a, a krill flake food, and I actually came or we came up with a formula and developed it and and you know produced it on a on a test basis, and it really yeah it kind of didn't work. It, the fish ate it because they were probably hungry and they would eat anything, um, but it wasn't that wow. It what you know it wasn't attracting a really good feeding response from the fish, and we actually asked people to try it and they came back with the same sort of feedback and then just chatting to some of my my ex-colleagues um from from tetra and from around the industry and one person said you you know you're not using the right quality of krill meal and we changed that and it was like chalk and cheese suddenly we got a food that the fish really wanted so yeah. you know if we launched the first one <laughs> people would have been saying well that's no good but mm -hmm. it's Getting that feedback from people that really helps to develop a better food. It does matter, and and being the kind of company that is approachable for for people to pass on that advice um, is important as well. You know, there is companies out there that don't really care. You know, they've they've got their their group of people that they listen to, their communities that they they will approach, and um, you know, think tanks or study groups or whatever you want, you know, whatever they're called, but. Um, one thing that stands out with yourself is you, you you listen to anybody that's got anything to say with regards to fish science. You know, you're out there, you talk to them, you respond face to face, you you know, respond personally through Facebook, you're you don't hide behind <laughs> but, but, you know, the important thing is that yeah, I, I I know a little bit about fish food, but there's so many more people that know other bits about fish food. And if you add the the all the good bits together, you end up with a, a better range of foods. And, yeah. and you know, and and the, the other thing, and the thing that I, I love about sort of working with a small business, to, which fish science is, is that you're very reactive. So you don't have to produce tens of thousands of a particular product. You know, we're, we're not limited to producing tons and tons of a food we can produce a smaller quantity and then if it isn't quite right we can change it and tweak it and keep going until we get the right format and the right formula that works for particular fish yeah and that's it it's an evolving product um if you weren't to listen and weren't to make changes then they would sink just like some of the tablets that you put in your tank <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah definitely but what Another question um, that I know I get asked whenever I talk about fish science is what, you know, insect meal, what does that mean? There's millions of insects. What, what exactly does insect meal mean as an ingredient in any food source? Um, well, specifically yours. Yeah, I mean, in, insect meal for, for me as fish science was, was the reason that I started fish science. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I... I when I left Tetra, my plan wasn't to to produce a f another fish food. It wasn't to stay in the fish food market, but a chance conversation with a, a an ex colleague, a friend about who who at the time was working for a company called Protix, who um, grow and and process insect meal, j j just was like a light bulb moment. You know, the, this guy said, "Do you think there's any any merit in using insect meal as a as a fish food?" And a, of course, that's what fish eat. You know, in the wild, they eat the insect larvae or the, the the adult insects. So it was just a start into the whole process of developing yeah. a range of foods that that used insect meal. And insect meal is, it, I mean, it, it it is the future. It's going to be the future. Not only I think of fish foods, but probably pet foods, and the companies are saying also human foods. You know they can produce it so effectively, so um, sustainably, and so efficiently, uh, and and they can produce just about anything. Um, you know we we started off using the black soldier fly larvae, so it's a, an insect called Hemetia lucens. It's 
um, it's about the, the width of your thumb. So it's not a big fly and it produces a larvae that's a little bit bigger, probably a, a centimetre, a centimetre and a bit long. But it grows from being an egg to um, a pupae within about 12 to 14 days. So it's a very quick turnaround from, from an egg to the pupae. And they grow on waste fruit, waste veg, brewery waste. They can also grow on compost. They'll grow on um, dead animals. You know, they, they'll grow. The, the black soldier fly will eat all sorts of things. The, the beauty of that is that you, by, by tailoring what you feed them, you can actually determine the nutritional profile of the insect. And so we've used just kind of standard black soldier fly that, that comes from Protix. Mm -hmm. and it's a brilliant active ingredient in the foods. The fish love it. You get slightly less waste. We've done some independent trials um, with a company in South Wales and, and demonstrated that things like the food conversion ratio, that's the amount of food you add that's converted into into meat in, you know into body tissue is slightly better than some of the big brands not, not massively but just a little bit better on all the fish that we tried it on um and you know it, it just was all positive but then if you take yeah. it a stage further you can swap the insect meal that you use so we've started now to use mealworm meal we use silkworm pupae um, you can use chironomid larvae the, the, the options are massive and by changing it, you can actually change the nutritional profile of the food that you've got. And this is where the human food thing comes in. You know, they're saying that they can make a food that will mimic fish or meat or anything else just by mm -hmm. changing the insects that they right. use and the food that they feed the insects to or food that they feed to the insects, I should say. Yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see It'd be interesting to see if certain fish reacted more stronger with different types of insects as well. Um, that'd be quite interesting. I know, um, oh, I, don't, I don't really know what insects, what I am, insects that fish prefer, but um, they must have, they must react for, you know, quicker with, with certain and types than others um so i mean have you come we, we we've i mean at the moment we, we're doing a little bit of work on that the the actual the opportunities are just almost unlimited in terms of you know at the moment we even with human food trials we're probably looking at you know, maybe there's 20 different species of insects being cultured and, and trialled, but there's hundreds of thousands of different species, so we could use all sorts. In terms of fish science, we the black soldier fly certainly triggers a really good feeding response. So I think we've been lucky with the first one that we tried that yeah. it delivers that, that good response. But interestingly, you know, adding a little bit of mealworm to it or certain others... D doesn't negate that response and and i think you know it just perhaps some of the insects maybe are a little bit stronger tasting or stronger smelling that will trigger a response in in certain fish that's something that we've got to look at you know it it'll be interesting to see whether we can find that perfect food for certain or perfect insect food for for certain fish you know discus would be a great option you know because clearly there's a You've got a fish that people really dote on and it is, is finicky to feed. So if we can find the right insect that just triggers that that feeding response, then we we would have a great response. <laughs> yeah. I'll bet. Um, there's a question that's just come on there from Alan Jones. Um, Yeah, you, you're just breaking up a little bit, John. Sorry, I didn't catch that. I'm back. Yes, 
can hear you. Um, <laughs> yeah, what I was trying to say is um, it'd be interesting to, to see if there was a, an insect that was really, really good for food. The, yeah, the, I mean, if you know, the insect was small enough to, to be for that treats or something but it was just more of the whole insect I don't know if I'm even making any sense here but um, yeah it, it, certainly that's an option um it, it would be a different way of looking at it, it would be more a treat food I think um because you know if, if you look at what the fish would eat in the wild they'll eat mm -hmm. 20 30 40 different types of insect and algae and bacteria and shrimps and snails and what have you um and and you know you could you've got to give them that mix of, of nutrients to make sure they get a balanced diet so just feeding one fly for example would give them one part of that diet and would be if you could get the right one that they like then it would be a great um a great treat food definitely uh you know it's it's maybe you know, and maybe that'll be the trigger. We can we can use insects as one of the replacements for live foods rather than just frozen versions of them. Yeah, definitely. Would be. Um, oops, since you've you know, since you started fish science with a the research idea to fish shop shelf. Is there anyone that you've liked, you know, enjoyed more than any others? In in terms of the foods, yeah, I, I know. I would... yeah, but uh, <laughs> I'm just meaning just in general with the whole the whole process of it. I I yeah I I think you know for me the biggest the food that's been the biggest challenge has been the worm pellets um we came up with a, a formula oh probably five years ago that worked but actually getting the ingredients has proved to be a, a real challenge so and you wouldn't think it things like earthworm you can get powdered floured versions of just about any ingredient but getting a consistent supply of earthworm meal could proved really difficult but now we've got it you know we, we managed to find a supplier and we have that uh, that that consistent supply that allows us to, to to produce the product so it's taken a while but it, and, and but, you know in doing so we've been able to trial it make sure that it was right and, and it certainly seems to be that you know people seem to respond really well and say their fish respond really well to it so it's uh, it's certainly a, you know for me has been a the most challenging food but but not in terms of development, just in terms of getting hold of it. So we're still having a few problems with the uh, the signal, I think. I don't know if people can hear me. I certainly now can't see John, so I'm guessing he's he's rebooting. Yeah, John was was obviously asking about, you know, favoured foods, and I mentioned the worm pellet. We've also got, you know, a few other foods that have, have proved challenging in, in different ways to develop and to get the ingredients and to, you know, produce a, a final version. So um, things like the microgranules have been an interesting one that we just just are tweaking the format rather than the formula. Um, 
with granules you tend to well the way that they're made is to make a pellet and then to smash it and then to sieve it so that you get a, a granule of a certain size um oh back again back. yeah Good. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I don't know what went wrong. I just disappeared. Yeah, don't worry. I was just t t sort of talking about the uh, microgranules. But yeah, I could hear, hear what you were saying. So, oh, that's good. Um, yeah. Just continue and finish what you were saying. And... Yeah, the, and the, the microgranules, you know, the, I, the way that they're made means that you end up with a, a granule with lots of points and, and the edges. And unfortunately, when the granules are packed and then the packs are obviously transported and people, you know, take the food out of the top, you end up with the sharp edges being knocked off. And so you end up with um, some granules at the top that are the size they're supposed to be, but you end up with a finer granule and, and almost some powder right at the bottom of the pack. So what we've done with that food is, is to actually start making a, a micro pellet so instead of it being a granule, it will be a 0.5 millimetre diameter pellet, which is, is the size that we were aiming for with the granule. But it will be more consistent sizes. There won't be the dust in the bottom. There won't be um, you know, the, the, the huge variation from 0.5 millimetres down to a powder. So the, uh, hopefully the food will be you know, more usable and, and more user friendly as well. It, uh, it's certainly, you know, I think that's the again one of the learnings that we've had in trying to develop better foods and it's, it's feedback we've had from from real fish keepers people that keep the food and you know perhaps have got the food at the end of the, the process when it's been through the wholesalers through the shops into their hands then there's been they've been feeding it for several months and then you know what's left in the bottom of the pot should be as good as the stuff that you start using it's interesting again john's disappeared but leading on from that it, it, um most people will buy a pot of food and and the, the research that i was involved in when we were when i was at tetra showed that most people buy food that lasts for two to three months so if you've got a small tank you buy a small pot of food if you've got a big tank you tend to just buy much more but you tend to keep it for for that two or three month period the important thing to do if if you are buying that food and buying it in, in bigger quantities is to make sure that it stays in good condition and the way that you can do that is, is firstly don't expose it to real high heat so don't put it on a windowsill or put it on the top of the tank where the light can make it really hot because that can denature some of the proteins and make them less effective um, the other thing is to make sure that it's not exposed to either air or water. Um, the air, the oxygen in the air will allow the, the food to start to denature a little bit. But the real sort of killer for, for fish foods is, is water. Um, they, most of the fish foods, most of the dry foods remain in good condition because of the really low level of, of uh water that's in them so you know they'll have perhaps six percent water if you put damp fingers in there or if you leave the lid off in near to the aquarium the moisture will get on the food and it will instantly start to act as a food source for bacteria and fungi and you just end up with a big kind of ball of food that's all matted together because of the fungal growth so you know you can buy foods keep them for quite a long time but just make sure that they're dry lower temperature and um and not exposed to the air too much yeah, sorry you're back again john i've found, I've found old fish foods before that um, i've opened them up and it's, it's just been disgusting especially flake food in my experience flake food can be bad for that yes um, yeah it's just it's a nightmare um, we spoke before about um different types of packaging um to try and get away from plastic and things and it's always an issue that you bring up um because it, it's just a constant challenge because of the nature of the storage space with fish food as well um obviously it's right underneath a fish tank most of the time yeah so, yeah tricky. We certainly loved you know one of my aims i guess is is to try and find an environmentally friendly packaging version that we can use for fish science mm -hmm. 
and uh, and there are some options you know you could use cardboard you could use um some of these sustainable um options the the trouble is actually it's, it's twofold one is they've got to be moisture resistant and the other is that they've got to be um you know not impact the food at all and i noticed richie suggested metal tins you can use metal tins um obviously the one of the issues with the metal tins is is if they do you know that if there is some of the metal that gets into the food but also is the the production cost of, of of doing them the plastic although you think it would be more expensive plastic is less expensive than the or certainly in in the trials and and the um the searches i've done it's a less expensive way of getting a, a tub of food and it's still recyclable as is the plastic mm -hmm. you know what i'd love to have is something that's compostable so that when you finish you put it in your compost and it breaks down but most of the compostable packaging works by coming into contact with moisture and then it starts to, to degrade and of course we talked about humidity above an aquarium or underneath an aquarium the last thing you want is you you pack degrading over a, a few weeks just because it's in a, a moist environment so also you, as well um with that would probably be in a bag style wouldn't it and not a lot of foods would work well in a bag even if it was like a pouch i think some of the foods would deteriorate just the flake would crumble probably a lot more if they were in a bag. Yeah, certainly flakes. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I guess bags are great for pellets and and perhaps tablets and wafers, but the flakes would be no good. The, the problem we've got as well is um, is is the actual insects, not the ones that we're using, but things like flower beetles and what have you that that like cereal and like the ingredients that we put into the foods. Mm -hmm. So they can smell it, and they'll bore straight through things like paper, oh, right enough, yeah, um, cardboard. Again, I remember you know going a long way back, probably thirty odd years, with Tetra products. Some people may remember used to be in a a cardboard tube with a with a plastic lid and a metal base, and they mm -hmm. were great. But we got quite a lot of issues with insect infestation, where they would just bore holes into it, and then they were kind of in heaven in a, in a oh. dry container with, filled with food and they just multiply and multiply. So yeah. the tub full of insects rather than the tub full of food. <laughs> yeah, well, you could feed the insects. They'll be fully yeah. packed, oh my goodness. Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, actually, you know, talking about feeding insects up and, and kind of enriching them, so to speak, there's a, a, a question I've just noticed from Richie. Um, I've just popped it up on the screen there. Uh, talking about um, koi keepers feeding freeze-dried mealworms and asking if they're nutritional. But I'd imagine those mealworms have been enriched to some extent, or am I completely wrong? Uh, both. The, 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 just the basic freeze-dried mealworm or cricket or, or silkworm pupae will have a certain amount of nutrients in them. Um, you know, so when, when you're drying, essentially what you're doing is taking out the moisture from the food and leaving the the, the, the proteins and the vitamins and the minerals and mm -hmm. carbohydrates, etc. So there will certainly be some benefit to feeding them. But if you were doing it yourself, you, and, and some of the companies will certainly enhance the foods by in two ways, either by getting a dusting that they put onto the, the full insect, if, if that's how you're buying it. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're buying a, a full mealworm, they can dust the powder onto it that's absorbed into the, the carapace of the insect. The other way is to feed them on a, on certain ingredients. So I know um, a lot of reptile keepers do that with mealworms and with crickets. They get a very vitamin rich or mineral rich food that they feed. And then that's sort of loading the intestine of the of the insect with a lot of vitamins and nutrients that you want to yeah. get inside the insect and for bigger fish you could do that exactly the same you know you could boost protein levels you could boost vitamin levels vegetable levels whatever you wanted you can also um i know some people certainly from the states that i've heard do that to get um, medication to their fish so what they'll do oh, is you know. feed kind of an antibiotic paste perhaps to the insects and then it's just it's just loaded into their intestine then you feed it 
and of course they swallow the insect straight down yeah. but you put the antibiotic into the inside of the fish which is where you want it to to be working so yeah. medicated feed certainly could be an option you know it could be a way of getting them them to work effectively i hope that answers the question richie um on a similar note um i'm not i'm not aware of this um this company but um james sheen's asked a question here um and he's talking about a fish food company in germany that produce food that try and replicate what the fish feed on in the wild now, i don't know if he's meaning replicate the way the fish would feed or the actual food itself um not a hundred percent but have you are you aware of this company I, I i know a little bit about them and i think what they're trying to do is is to to do exactly that so they're taking their whole process a, a step further than, than than we've done so we're trying to use insect meal and similar vegetables and and natural components to recreate a balanced diet for the fish yeah. and what they're doing is using some of the insects perhaps that they would they would actually feed on in the wild uh, which, which is quite possible it's difficult to do it in big quantities and it, it can be sporadic so you know if you think of things like daphnia um bloodworm you, you you actually need things that you can culture in massive amounts to produce reasonable amounts of fish food if you yeah. if you're doing it for yourself you can be very specific um but once you get to bigger quantities of food you, you've got to make sure you've got that backup of the nutrients there and the ingredients that you so that you're not going to be out of stock at any one time but it's mm -hmm. you know, the, the, I, I guess the optimal is to be able to feed exactly what a fish from the amazon would eat in the amazon both in terms of the nutrients but also where it comes from but right. to do that you've got to be you know taking taking some of those nutrients from from the wild so it could mm -hmm. be costly but could be fun <laughs> oh yeah absolutely yeah fantastic mm -hmm. so um I mean, obviously we're, we're just went over the half an hour mark there but um I think a nice way to move towards the end of the chat is just to, to kind of rack your brains and find out what, what's coming um, in the future. I know you've mentioned um, you've got a couple of foods that are almost ready just to hit the shelves now, um, but is there anything you know bouncing about in your head that you're, you're thinking about or exploring or without giving too much away, obviously? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah no, it's, uh, I mean, <laughs> the, the ones that are... are kind of just in production almost at, at the moment are a cichlid pellet and a, a shrimp food and mm -hmm. now we, we interestingly we just started to talk to a, a company that are producing massive amounts of or, or commercial quantities of nettle meal so that's something that would be yeah. really interesting to add to the that'd be good for shrimps um, as well. good for the shrimps it's also it's got some of the ingredients that are really good for fish so mm -hmm. it, it's it's just exploring it a little bit more because I, I haven't done lots of work on it because it wasn't available in big quantities. So that, that's yeah. an interesting one. Um, in, in terms of the foods that it would be nice to have to add to the fish science range, I, I, we're certainly working on a, a sinking large worm pellet, something that's suitable for rays, um, the bigger catfish and the perhaps some of the cichlids. So that yeah. should be relatively straightforward. Um, well, that's we a similar um, formula to the the worm pellet that you've got just now. That that's the idea, and just just probably to make uh, add a little bit more um, fish meal, herring meal, in, mm. into it, so that you you try and replicate that more fish based diets that some of those fish would eat. Um, I know, uh, see, Richie's on screen, but certainly. Um, a discus food is something that we're we're looking at i with the discus food uh, we've tried a few different versions and what i don't want to do is just come up with a discus food you know th th there's some good foods out there that people are using in big quantities i'd like to have something that stands apart from the other foods because mm -hmm. it's better because the fish like it more because it's you know it can form a really key part of a, a discus's diet so we're looking again at um, using the insect meal, using worm meal, 
and using that as the basis of of, of a discus food. Yeah, um, I think um, we can go back to a question that I I think I disappeared at this point, but it was Alan Jones. He was asking about um, some baby food. Um, I didn't know. I don't know what he said, obviously, because I disconnected. But um, yeah, um, he, he's just obviously wanting to know if there's going to be more baby food coming out or or anything more specific. Yeah, well, we've we've got one baby food at the moment. We've got the fry food, which is available just in a little ten gram sachet, and that's insect meal based. Um, it's quite a rich formula. It's got quite a, a a wide range of different ingredients in it to try and recreate the um, that that sort of diet that the the fry want to be able to develop yeah. when they first start. Um, I would love to come up with a, a, a different you know a range of different sized fry foods um, whether it's commercially possible I don't know but there's you know clearly some of the egg laying fish species the fry are tiny and you know you'd need a really fine powder to uh, to you know for them to be able to eat whereas some of the live bearers want a much coarser powder um, mm. so it would be nice to get several grades of a fry food that would actually be suitable for the different fry or for the small fry as, as they start to grow. Um, yeah, so they, they yeah I mean, you can sell them in kits, I'd imagine, as well. If you, you, you know, you can have it from the, the food that stimulates breeding mm. <laughs> right through to, you know, first bite type food, you know, to fully grown. Yes, yeah. And I think that's, it's it's looking at ways like that, that we can, you know, we can maybe utilise some of the the diets that would you know would really work well in the future. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 there is a lot of you know, there's lots. You, you can become more and more specific in the in the foods that we produce. I yeah. guess what I want to try and avoid is is ending up with too many foods in the range, because if you do that, you then end up with issues where you've got foods that don't sell, and therefore they. You know they get to their best before yeah. date and, yeah. and just aren't one aren't thing possible. yeah one thing you see on your website um is one thing when you were designing the labels you wanted it to be simple straightforward yeah people come into a fish shop they, they're looking for a food that is for a you know a, a herbivore food or you know, you know a specific species the label would the fish on the label would say that's the same kind of fish or the right type of fish Turn it over, it tell you what's in it. Bang, bang, bang. You know there would be no mistake in what you were getting. You wouldn't stand in front of the fish food range for twenty minutes trying to work out which one you want and you know which one's right. So I guess having too many fish food choices would reduce that element that you've always tried to maintain. I, I think so because uh, you know the, the majority of people obviously. Perhaps the people that that we're we're speaking to at the moment are are, are specialist fish keepers and and have very mm -hmm. um, a good idea of exactly what food they need and 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 will almost pick foods and add them together to get a perfect mix. But the vast majority of fish keepers probably use flake food, or they might use a flake food and a tablet, or they might use granules and a tablet. But they only use a limited number of food, so. Mm -hmm. you, you've got to be careful not to overcomplicate the range so that you you lose people by making it you know just too complicated yeah um so we, we're trying to do that certainly trying to make it a select range and, and keep it quite quite tight mm -hmm. um but you know in doing so also we, we've, we've still got options to actually improve the foods that we've got i think there yeah. are ways that we can make them even better and that's that's you know one of the things that's happening i hope is happening in the next few months as well Mm -hmm. Is there any such thing as a a seasonal food? Um, now, oh, um, certain fish obviously you can stimulate them, and the weather outside can affect the the pressure of the water inside. Um, uh, somebody who won't be on tonight, but Colin Dunlop, a lot of people are known from his um, channels. Uh, he he spent a long time telling me about how the weather outside really does affect your fish behaviour, um, you know, should met on his barometer and it, it does, he, he uses a, a normal barometer 
I think that's what they're called, um, to work out when it's starting to increase. And he'll then go into his, you know, his snakehead house and he can match their behaviour to what's going on outside the, the fish hut as well. It's really well. remarkable. So, you know, things like Corey's um, with the wet seasons and they must pick up on the water, you know, our weather and our seasons as well. So uh, is there any way would it be worth it having a, a food that was only available at certain times and it comes and goes, you know, you know um, a specific winter food for catfish or something? Yeah, I mean, we well, we certainly we do that on the pond side um, where in the winter you would feed a wheat germ based food because it's more easy to digest. But I think there probably is some merit, you know, if we had a we could look at some sort of breeding conditioning food because most of the examples that, that were, if, um, not with Collins fish but in a lot of cases the, the biggest change that people want is something that um, they want something that is it's going to condition their fish you know what the rainy season generally means the fish are going to get ready to spawn so yeah if you were doing that in you you would add perhaps more live foods or you'd add a slightly higher protein food so they can develop the the reproductive organs mm -hmm. so yeah there could be a way of of coming up with a in inverted commas a conditioning food that just gets yeah. the fish into peak condition it wouldn't be something you'd feed all the time because they wouldn't want that level of of protein but just no, for no you could it would be, it would be perfect yeah. Yeah. definitely so an option yeah fantastic another idea <laughs> yeah another one to put to the list <laughs> yeah um i think what we'll do now um is we'll ask people that are still watching have not got bored of us or or <laughs> walked away but um invite people to just put questions in the comments um and we'll just run through a few questions if that's okay with you dave of course it is yeah 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 if anybody's um, got any questions i'll always try and answer them <laughs> what about you john cunningham um You've used fish science for quite a while now. Um, I know you've got quite a lot of shrimps, but um, is there any questions that you've got to ask about um, any any food that you'd like to see Dave create or, or any questions on food that you've already got? Um, Richie, um, well, we know you do live, live chats with Richie as well, so um, Richie's got quite a lot of fish science food um and he's, he's desperately working on the discus food as well um so i um, looking for any questions from anybody that's watching we've got 14 people watching just now so um we'll just kind of hang about and see if it's got this keith borthwick uh i went to school with keith i've known keith for a long time and um, he's a good friend i'll just put your question up keith there we go um, is it safe enough to feed my fish mosquito larvae? I read it can cause stomach problems. Uh, live from the garden pail, the lost fish with stomach problems. Is it connected? I, I don't think so. I, I don't know for certain. Uh, taking it in two ways. Um, first of all, can you feed mosquito larvae? Absolutely. Um, you know, they're, they're a great food. You can catch them from a, a you know just a, a pond or from a tub or whatever you can add them to the aquarium the fish will love them and you know they really go well on it don't add too many because you make need to make sure that the fish eat everything otherwise you have uh, midges and mosquitoes appearing hatching out pretty quickly in in terms of the stomach problems i've not heard of that when they're fed in small quantities and i think with you know with feeding any live food like that it is really just a supplement so it's it's a treat that you would give several times a week and you give it because the fish like it but also because for me it's that's part of the fun of fish keeping is getting mosquitoes or or um, insects or or you know mushrooms or, or just unusual foods and adding them to the to the tank and seeing the response from the fish mm -hmm. I, I guess where there could be issues are if they're growing and you know again we were talking about what the insects are eating so if if they're from a a, so a polluted bucket or pail or, or tub of water then you need to make sure that you just rinse them so that you get rid of any dirty water or any contaminants that could cause problems mm -hmm. that's the 
something that I could think that could cause you issues with with something like mosquito larvae, not the actual larvae themselves. They should be great. Okay. I hope that answers your case, uh, question, Keith. Thanks very much for that. Um, right. We've got one from Bob Anderson here. I'll just pop that up. Um, one second. All right, Bob, that's your question up. Are you going to do soft foods in the future? Yeah, we, 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 we're trying to go more. In fact, we've launched a couple of semi-soft foods. So they're, they're not as soft as, um, sort of, for example, the Vitalis range of foods that are, you, you know, you can squeeze and you can, you can feel they're very soft. The ones we've got are just, they've got, um, they give a little bit, enough so that the fish don't reject them when they actually eat a, a hard pellet. So it's just like a semi-soft pellet. So we, we've we've gone to that stage. Um, yes, we're looking, always looking at some other options. But at the moment, I've got no plans to go to a full range of soft pellets. But it, it may certainly be an option, you know, moving forwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Bob. And uh, thanks, Dave. Um, all right. Next question. Um, Alan's just asking about the mosquito larvae. He's wondering if that's what flies about his head at night, but... Um, <laughs> I don't think that will be this, the same. Mosquito larvae live right at the surface of uh, water, don't they? And they've got their little funny tails. Like That's that. it, yeah. 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 But you can also get, obviously, the, the chironomid, the bloodworms, are also a, a you know a mosquito larvae. So mm -hmm. you've got those as well. Right. So, and both are fine for the fish. You know, just, yeah. just make sure that they're, they're rinsed so that they're clean. Okay. Um, just as you mentioned, um, bloodworm there, uh, Richie, um, Obviously, you know Richie quite well. Um, he's got a question here. Um, he's heard uh, a lot of BS on the discus groups. You shouldn't feed bloodworm. Uh, my argument is it's natural. Beef hearts don't swim down the Amazon. <laughs> no, they don't. Um, and it's, it's a popular question. Um, one I see quite a lot um, all over the internet and, and in person. Beef heart is a very popular discus food. Um, for, for good reasons, it's popular and they, they eat it really well, um, but it's not a natural food source. So um, what what do you take from that, Dave? Well, I, I mean, certainly in terms of the bloodworm, I, I think feed it as as part of the diet. So if you feed a little bit of, of live bloodworm or frozen bloodworm, then there's no issue at all. So, mm -hmm. you know, addressing that, that question, I, again, just bear in mind that bloodworm is only, you know, is, is, is one part of the diet. So, you know, take it as one fiftieth of what the fish would normally eat. So don't concentrate on bloodworm and don't give them anything else other than that, because if you did that, then yes, you would have problems. Beef heart certainly, you know, has, has, has become recognised as a, as a great food for discus. And it's something I think that they're fed on, they get used to, and therefore they want to feed on it. Yeah. It's, it's not a natural food, but it's got high protein. It's in a format that the, the discus seem to like. It also is a good base, you know, so you can use the, the beef heart and then you can add vitamins, minerals, other bits and pieces to it to, to make sure that you're providing a more balanced diet. But beef heart's exactly the same as the bloodworms. If, if all you fed was pure blood beef heart and nothing else, I think your fish would suffer because there isn't that range of nutrients in, in beef heart. It so yeah. might be a very nutritious food, but it's not a balanced nutritious food. It's just, just one part of the diet. Absolutely. So, uh, I think that's that's certainly you know, my take. And beef heart is, is something, we, you know, we, we've been asked whether we should include it in fish science foods, and, and, and the short answer is no, we can't. Um, nearly all of the commercial... The, the, the larger commercial companies can't use animal products in their diets because of the BSE situation from a few years ago. You just mm -hmm. can't add, you can't risk contaminating the, the factory with beef or poultry or um, lamb or, or pork products because if there was any BSE type issues, it just stops you exporting, stops you doing any, any uh, wider scale food work. Yeah, um, and it's obviously something you need to take care of. Yeah, um, we've got a comment here from John Cunningham. Um, he's not got a question, he's just passing on that um, he thinks the oak 
uh, Oak, the new play called there. That'll be the Oak and Algae. Um, yeah, it's a superb. I uh, just wanted to say, David. So yeah, uh, and it, you know, we, we were talking right at the start about how listening to fish keepers can help in developing a food, and and the use of oak bark is is one example of that, where it, again a chance conversation with a fish keeper who used oak bark, used oak twigs, and and used to just put them in his his tank and let the plex take the bark off and then he'd take them out and replace them <laughs> and that was the the seed of a thought to actually try the oak bark in a product and we've gone from there to using it to uh to you know proving really successful yeah um that's a very good one um i've even fed it to my um hermit crabs <laughs> um, they gorge on it and then literally just roll over and just lie there for about a whole day <laughs> and <that's, laughs> just can't eat it anymore Fantastic. So um, it's, it's a hit all round. Um, here's another question. Um, we'll maybe only take maybe one or two more. Um, we're you know, close to an hour now. But um, this one's from Carl Bethel. He's in South Wales. Um, you'll know Carl. Um, Carl's yes. um, been in touch. He's tried out a few foods and, and gave us a lot of feedback on some food that we're developing. Um, and possibly even the, the oak and algae one as well. He's probably played a part in the the testing of that, if I'm right. But the question is, is I'm a several species of geophagus, absolutely love the insect granules. They go down well with most of my fish. Um, and to be honest, no, oh, to be honest, any plans for a pellet larger for the South American species? Well, you answered this question just before Carol came on, um, but I'll, I'll let you explain directly to Carol. Yeah, we, I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to say yes. Um, we, we've got a cichlid pellet that we're going to launch in the very near future, which is, um, it's a floating pellet. It's got, it's a rough, roughly four millimetres by two and a half, three millimetres in size. And it's based on the worm pellet formula so a little bit more insect meal in it but uh, it's a floating pellet aimed at the, the the south american cichlids and some of the larger tropical fish species so it's a great food it's got about 60 percent products of animal origin in it which includes worm meal insect meal shrimp krill fish so um, you know hopefully a food that would would meet what carl's looking for yeah. and then moving sort of further forward we're looking at this bigger sinking pellet um which would be aimed at the probably a four or a five mil pellet that would be aimed at the the bigger species as well and particularly the catfish and and of course any cichlids that will feed off the bottom rather than midwater rather than on the surface mm -hmm. so there you go carl something's coming soon yes um, definitely. uh right okay here's another question from Bob Anderson, um, can you grind down the Cory tablet? Tablet? Can you grind down the Cory tablet food to feed to your baby fry? Absolutely, um, and and quite a few people do that. Either um, grinding it down and just sort of pinching the food and, and pushing it under the surface and letting it sink, or actually making it into a, a paste and and you know putting it on the bottom so that the the fry can uh, can get it. Because obviously the the tablets are made by um, producing quite a fine powder that you then compress, and essentially it's the compression that keeps it together. So if mm -hmm. you break that apart, you can end up with sort of a very fine powder that would be perfect for for cori fry and what have you. Yeah, I mean cori is is a very popular um, pellet, you know, tablet, sorry that. I think I've not heard one single person say that they've not had an outrageous feeding response from them. So um, it, I'm not sure if it's the smell for the fish or if it's the taste, but, um, you know, you ask anybody if they tried this or if they tried that, and if they tried the quality food, if every, every single person that's tried it, I'll tell you that it's a fantastic food. Yeah, um, we've we certainly had some great feedback on it and uh, and worked with Ian Fuller to develop it. Um, you know, Ian was was sort of instrumental in in getting it to the format that we've got it at at the moment. But you know, and, and it's again it's quite a rich food. We've got things like cucumber in there, we've got insect meal, the shrimp and krill. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a nice food. I'm really pleased with the curry tabs. Yeah. 
Um, well, I don't know if I've got any more questions. Um, no, no more questions. Brilliant. Anybody's got or typing anything just now, but um, I think tonight went a lot better than last week. I'm yeah, we seem, we seem to be getting the hang of this. So uh. <laughs> definitely, um, I don't know what happened um, with my with well, me. I just vanished. It quite possibly was the fact that I didn't have the extension plugged in and it died on me. So <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's what went wrong, but. Um, yeah, that won't happen next week, and we'll have a, a far better experience, and we'll get better and better. Um, yeah. As long as Dave's happy to come back, well, I'm happy to keep talking to him and, and get new guys on and just enjoying ourselves. Sounds good. Yeah, let's do it. De definitely. <laughs> uh, just a quick one, just before you go, Dave, um, Alan Jones is asking um, more of a retail question, but I'll pop that up there for you, Dave. Um, he's asking if we'll be sending out free samples of the new foods to shops to try at the moment. Um, he bags up uh, from pots from for his customers, which has been a success. So people are obviously taking up the samples, but you're just wondering if there's any samples available to them. We, we, we'll sit, as soon as we have product, then yes, we'll get the samples out. Um, the, the, the situation at the moment with the obviously with the virus is that mm. I and and Trevor, the uh, sales guy that works with me, aren't able to or. Oh, Take the decision not to be traveling around. I don't think it's safe for us to be doing it. And it's unfair on the shops to have somebody kind of taking up space when they want customers in there. So what we're doing is actually trying to contact shops and send out samples or we'll be sending out samples of the new foods as soon as they're available. Yeah. So I expect that to be around about three to four weeks. And then we'll have as soon as we have the foods and obviously we'll put be putting and publicizing things on social media and also getting samples out to the shops. Good. Hopefully um, things change and keep getting better um, and you can get back out to the shop soon as well. That would be great. Yeah, looking yeah, forward to that. Definitely. But until then, um, we'll get you back on here next week. Um, and if anyone else is watching, look out for them popping up all over the internet right now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks very much, Dave. Um, I'll you. get off just now. Um, I just want to put Darren Evans just Unfortunately, you've just turned up as we're finishing, pal. Um, that's a shame. He's from the, the British Cyclist Association. Oh, that's a shame, yeah. yeah. Um, never mind. Next week, Darren, 8 o'clock. But, um, yeah, thanks again, Dave. Um, I'll let you get away, and um, I'll just finish up with everybody in the group here. That's great. Thanks All so right. much. Take Good night, easy. everyone. Bye-bye. So, guys, thanks very much. Uh, for joining us um, and taking part, uh, it's great to get all the questions coming up. Um, if you've got any more info, you know any more questions about what Dave said, feel free to just send me a message or send Dave a message on the Fish Science page, and he'll be happy to get back to you. So um, yeah, thanks again, guys. It's been a lot better this week. I've really enjoyed myself, um, and I look forward to next week. Take it easy. Bye. Bye, guys.